or, as in the case of Descartes, by the power of some philosophical theory or ideology." End quote. Our regular behavior and interactions assume, through their very intelligibility and efficacy, what we might call the world and reality of other lives in whose midst we act and are ourselves constituted. Put succinctly, to be someone is necessarily to be with other someones. It is important not to deflate this essentially hermeneutic capability by qualifying it, for example, as non-cognitive, because, as McIntyre explains, quote, it is a form of practical knowledge, a knowing how to interpret, that arises from those complex social interactions with others in which our responses to others and their responses to our responses generate a recognition by them and by us of what thoughts and feelings it is to which each is responding." End quote. McIntyre goes on to acknowledge the animal parameters of such interactivity. And in a salutary moment of cross-species sensibility, Heidegger anticipates this kind of admission in his comments about being able to go along with animal others. Yet Heidegger fumbles, and notoriously so, and so we need to look elsewhere for inspiration on this matter. <clears throat> we can question whether an objective phenomenology of bodily being can establish, for instance, existential resonance as a similarity of life world sufficient to carry intersomatic experiences across speciated difference. Several posthumanists have supplied accounts of cross species conviviality that effectively answer in the affirmative, although they have not thematized their own studies in accord with the precise formulation of this question. With respect to biocultural worldhood, Vicki Hearn's treatment of training work animals, drawing on the views of Wittgenstein and Stanley Cavell, and Kenneth Shapiro's psychosomatic kinesiology of relations with companion animals, both furnish compelling testimony of intercorporeal cohabitation between members of different species. Likewise, from the perspective of wilderness experience, David Abram and Dan Polk convincingly bear deeply ecological witness to flesh of the world, that's Merleau Ponty's term, as an earth home replete with the commingling of various organisms, material and live body. Furthermore, human beings are terrestrial animals embedded in evolutionary reality. Consciousness of evolution has existential consequences in that it leads us to the self-knowledge that we are earthbound organisms, and as such, conduct our lives in climatic conviviality with other animals. Somatic phenomena become particularly pronounced in the felt presence of what we could call climaticity. As one commentator, Watsuji Tetsuro, notes, quote, it will no doubt be evident that there are certain points of similarity between the problem of climate and that of body. The self-active nature of climate must be retrieved in the same sense that the self-active nature of the live body has to be retrieved. In effect, what's going on here is an attempt to rescue the existential category of climate give it the same treatment that Heidegger and others gave history, historicity, on the level of time, doing this in, on the level of space and place. As ontologists, in spite of traditional metaphysics, we transcend neither terrestrial nature nor the carnal, visceral experience of physical living. Quite to the contrary, quote, transcendence also stands outside climatically. In other words, man discovers himself in climate. This becomes consciousness of the body, and thus climatic phenomena show man how to discover himself as standing outside, i.e. ex history. End quote. More recently, this insight has been underscored by Elliot Deutsch. As he says, a body must always be some place and indeed has its very being only in relation to natural conditions and to other bodily beings." End quote. Once outside, speaking in terms of phenomenological vitality, 
We must admit certain speciated distinctions across the spectrum of existentially embodied awareness of environment. As one ethologist, Sven Dijkstraat, has put it, quote, every animal perceives the external environment only through what its senses can find out about it. It lives in a world of its own, which is more or less distinct from that of other animals and that of human beings. Such distinctions are partly based on differences in construction of the sense organs, but they are primarily evoked by different modes of life, end quote. Dijkroff rightly places his emphasis on life mode rather than on sensory equipment. On the basis of his account, it becomes possible to explicate why anyone even entertains the hypothesis of imaginative transspeciation. From Dijkroff's perspective, for example, what tempts transspecific imagination is that, despite differences of perceptivity, a dog keeper and her companion animal, for instance, share a certain lifestyle based on the common performance of many household activities. Note again here, existential resonance coming to the fore. Even so, some skeptics might suppose that the sensory differences involved overwhelm any other basis for comparison. There's just too much perceptual drag, as it were, for a satisfactory impression of the other animal's experience to get off the ground. A good deal of the skepticism here is a priori in nature. And there are intrepid phenomenologists who have attempted what may only seem to be impossible. For example, following a Gertian me methodology of qualitatively descriptive science, one Craig Holdring has mounted phenomenological studies of several animal species. Quote, any human being who has not been totally blinded by a Cartesian or behaviorist dogma knows that cats, squirrels, mice, and deer are all creatures that experience the world, end quote, he claims. This knowing is not intellectual. It is a kind of felt knowing based on the direct interactions we have with animals. Holdrake does not relegate such understanding to the status of mystical experience, however. Instead, he mobilizes a powerful method for articulating its content. One illustration of, of his to which we may refer is the worldhood of moles. Quotation from him now. In imagining the tactile world of the mole, we must strip away what is so familiar to us, our colorful and airy world of sight and hearing. We can picture ourselves in a dark, quiet, enclosed space where the surface of our body touches myriad objects. Since our sense of touch is most refined in fingertips and tongue, we can imagine concentrating our perceptions of weight, texture, and temperature through these organs. In this way, we can begin to acquaint ourselves with the tactile world, which normally stands in the shadows of our more dominant and focal visual and auditory experiences." End quote. Yes, the empathetic imagination bridges here, but it is grounded, pun intended, by rigorous acquaintance with the habits, anatomy, and physiology of the target species, and by sympathetic comparison that joins experiences, allowing us to virtually perceive and move alongside the other related creature. The star nosed mole is so called because it is literally headed by an exquisite organ of haptic receptivity. Quote, under a microscope, the star's surface looks like a honeycomb of about 25,000 little dome-like structures called Einer's organs. Each Einer's organ, in turn, consists of three different types of sensory receptors for detecting vibrations, pressure on the skin, and the texture of objects, end quote. A kind of dialectic between empirical and imaginative study leads not directly into the mole, of course, but nonetheless beyond total agnosticism and away from cartoon caricatures. It is an epistemological, epistemologically legitimate method responsible both to experience and for creativity. Quote, the point is to build up vivid pictures of the animal from as many sides as possible. 
by continually immersing ourselves in concrete observation and then connecting our observations to vivid inner images, we enter into a conversation with the animal. The animal begins to show itself, end quote. We are brought, at least partially, along the quasi-transpositional path of phenomenology that Heidegger identified as going along with the animal. We thereby neither achieve nor pretend, of course, to a colonization of another's consciousness. Still, it is important not to lose sight of the basic biocommonality that serves as the necessary context of similarity for intelligently making what distinctions are warranted or otherwise. Different species varying sensory modalities are embodied in life worlds. They also serve some form of living incarnation. It is live body man, then, that can function as a conduit for interspecific conviviality. Now, one experiential and conceptual context for such chiasmic attentiveness is the late Merleau-Ponty's notion of flesh of the world. The term chiasmic involves the blending the reversible exchange between my flesh and the flesh of the world that occurs in the play of perception, according to Merleau. This interweaving, this ongoing communion between divergent aspects of a single flesh is to be found in every level of experience. To deepen our comprehension of this notion and reality, flesh of the world that is. We need to understand it is a world of holistic carnality that immerses, surrounds, and permeates the individual's lived body. Thus, in the words of David Abram, Merleau-Ponty dissolves the traditional division between the human animal and all other organisms of the earth. The flesh of the world is the consanguinity of organisms on the level of ecosystem and even biosphere. As Abram says, quote, no thinker can really move from his or her bodily self-awareness to the intersubjectivity of human culture and thence to the global transcendence that is flesh of the world without coming upon myriad experiences of otherness, other subjectivities that are not human, and other intersubjectivities, end quote. World flesh, then, constitutes a thoughtscape and a life world broad enough to conceptually and experientially incorporate intercarnal phenomena that traverse species. In this life world, disclosures of organic history and a description of the human animality intertwining become possible. Abram's synopsis sets the stage, quote, Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of the Flesh provides a way to describe and to disclose the living fields of interaction from our experience place within them, end quote. We can place this phenomenological lifescape on a hermeneutic plane of description by interpreting it through the thematic lens of residence. In this view, the flesh of the world becomes manifestly Earth as home. The danger in such an interpretation is that the diversity of world flesh might be over-domesticated by the Earth home concept into a romantic vision of nature under the aspect of harmonious holism. One theorist, Jane Bennett, has argued persuasively against eco-sophistical faith in this sort of worldview. In its stead, she proposes a more multivalent or plurivocal sense of what she calls fractious holism. The idea may sound cryptic at first. A good metaphor to convey its sense is that of mosaic, which presents a whole in piecemeal fashion as a fragmentary gestalt. Perhaps, the best simile for a world as body is rather that of stew, that is the thick soup, comprising a common medium that permeates even the cores of nonetheless identifiably separate chunks of matter. Certainly such imagery is better, that is truer to the phenomena, than that available from the conventional imaginary of cultural diversity and integration which is usually discussed in terms of the assimilationist melting pot or the aggregational, still externally relational, salad bowl image. However, as Shannon Sullivan has noted, even the metaphor of stew is imperfect because it seems to presuppose a decided passivity on the part of the individual ingredients. 
Whereas the elements of nature do include organisms who or that are active agents, contributing to the flavor of various social and ecological systems. Hence, Sullivan turns to musical metaphors. She considers and rejects orchestral imagery because it is too beholden to a supervisory conductor and or overarching score. Finally, she offers and settles upon the metaphor of jazz improvisation, which has the advantage of playing up individually spontaneous, yet holistically loyal, co-constitution of parts and whole. This image is indeed suitable for social situations, amongst which there are some that are interspecific, yet other natural settings do not necessarily feature agents as self-conscious as the improvising performers in a jazz band. So, we may have to content ourselves here with metaphoric imperfection. Whatever metaphor one prefers to employ, the stew or the jazz ensemble, endorsing the view of fractious holism suggested by Bennett would mean giving some weight to the phenomenal fact that terrestrial carnality, that is world flesh or earth bone, is not experientially lived as an undifferentiated or placid whole. Rather, it is fraught with all the existential tensions arising out of its spatio-temporal divisibility into relatively individualized organisms and biomes. The convivial challenge for humans, then, is to interpret the skin boundary not as an impermeable barrier encapsulating corporeality, but as a surface of somatic contact. In Paul Shepard's words, quote, the epidermis of the skin is like a pond surface or a forest soil, not a shell so much as a delicate interpenetration. It reveals the human self ennobled and extended because the beauty and complexity of nature are continuous with ourselves. Or as John Compton puts it, what is characteristic of embodied intersubjective world-related human life is structurally analogous to what is found in other living regions of the natural world." End quote. In meeting this challenge, it becomes possible to transcend our strictly Kerberlish limitations and thus to more broadly define the modus vivendi of flesh and blood being in a world as what we could call Ibis Heimsville, home world or territory of live bodies. Let us take stock now for a moment of our ontological position and its relation to the issue with which we began. Throughout the preceding phenomenology and hermeneutics of cross-species content, what I have called existential resonance emerged as a common thread of analysis. I believe that both embodied empathy and somatic sympathy contribute to our residential sensibility across species. The former to connect different kinds of animal between different types of territory, and the latter to share the basic commonality of inhabiting a home world at all, of being an entity that resides in the first place. Resonance is not the only common characteristic among animal kinds. Movement, in particular self-animation, is another. And those who study this feature of animality have developed avenues of cross-species understanding on its basis. Take Janet Kalo, for instance. She is a psychotherapist and kinesiologist whose goal has been to encourage people to own their experiences through expanding their personal knowledge and expression of embodiment. Because in doing that, in giving people back their own embodiment, she claims, they become much more sensitive to the embodiment of others and what it means to be part of the living organic movement system that our shared animal world is, end quote. How is this possible? Quote, by bringing our attention initially to our own breath and our sense of weight, answers Kayla and then extending that interest and awareness to another animal's breathing and sense of weight. And finally, taking our attunement into the other's quality of movement in time and space." End quote. Another means of interspecies connection is sketched by the eco-psychologist Gene Myers, who tracks empathy back to emotion matching rooted in the mirror neuron system, and notes that children often, as he puts it, imaginatively translate their bodily form into an animal's via the imitation exercises of pretend play. 
At this point, I would like to offer a sympathetic model of mixed species community. One that would prepare us to move from bodily ontology onward to moral psychology. First, along with Merleau Ponty, quote, we must accept that consciousness is essentially incarnate. It is not in a body, but it is a matter of animate, responsive bodily existence itself. The upshot is revelatory, for this common carnal inheritance sets all living beings in contact, in community with one another. What Merleau-Ponty calls flesh of the world signifies that all carnalities are implicated in one another. Indeed, at least for self-conscious beings, fleshly alterity and identity are co-constitutive, as are human and animal. Husserl recognizes the former, and Merleau acknowledges the latter. A strange proximity animates such, what I call, symphusis. Another synonym for this would be somatic sympathy. Quote, all living bodies are nodes or folds of reflexivity cleaved in the same flesh. They all belong to the same carnal world, the same differentiating and connective tissue or field of being, or body, the capital B. In this context, those with conscience register hermeneutic responsibility. The only responsible manner for us to relate to our non-human cohabitants is one that does not negate their alterity, nor denies them any kinship at all with our manner of being." End quote. What I'm calling symphosis is meant, or that word is meant to convey the sense of sharing with somebody else a some aesthetic nexus experienced through a direct or systemic interrelationship. Corresponding morally to symphosis would then be an idea of ethical sensorium by or through which some physical encounters and memories happen and be circulate, existentially and axiologically. I have introduced new terminology here because I believe talking of synthesis is the best way to describe the proto-ethical feeling that assures us of another animal being's morally considerable capacity for conviviality. Inferential reasoning by analogy may rationally justify that assurance, and psychology of imagination may scientifically explain it via empathic projection, but only somatologies of genus being fellow feeling with other species, that is, can phenomenologically articulate its actual experience. Consider the somatic interpretation. Consider that somatic interpretation is neither exclusively composed of nor primarily based on cogitation. In the first instance, it is more felt than thought, and it retains, at least residually, affective aspects even upon reflection. Moreover, I do not regard this feature as an automatic liability, despite the general trend in ethical theory to discount, restrain, or rationalize the emotions, at least, that is, until rather recently, for which you can see uh, essays by and works by uh, Elisa Alto that have recently been published. I claim not just that embodied emotion is really more rational than we thought, but also in an equal importance that it is more valuable, even in its irrational aspect, than most moral philosophers have been ready to grant. Ken Shapiro demonstrates that when members of different species share a common living arrangement, for example, a household or workspace, it is possible for them to surmount sensorimeter barriers and attain viable practices of nonverbal bodily communication effectively mutual understanding. Now, Shapiro's findings risk being understood by a certain form of oversight. Basically, the difficulty lies in conceiving trans-specific situations under the exclusive rubric of empathy, a mistake that often occurs in phenomenological literature dealing with experience of other animals. Empathetic methodology is prone to be ontologically misleading, for empathy itself normally serves, theoretically at least, as the psychic principle of intersubjectivity, that is, as a solution to the so-called problem of other minds. 
But to use empathy exclusively in this way is to presume an ontology that grants the presence already of subject-object division and subject-subject separation. In other words, it is to assume an ecological horizon of original experience. Such an assumption, however, reverses the actual order of existential development. Far from being prior, a solipsistic scenario is rather a reflective abstraction away from community context. When that community is multi-specific, the primary experiential principle of conviviality is the bodily one that I am calling symphosis. Reversions in empathy talk will undercut appropriate description. Thus, it is important to choose terminology carefully. To her credit, Edith Stein qualifies the experience at stake as sensual empathy. <clears throat> Adding that for the purposes of precision, we should refer to einem Findung rather than einem Fühlung. But sensing in is still too projective a phrase, for it suggests that convivial experience is had by a person of something, possibly inert, into which that person must, as it were, cast the actuality of animation. Yet conviviality does not come about like this, at least not exactly so. It occurs instead through communal experience with somebody already alive, synphysically, where phusis signifies living matter. Hence, in remaining loyal to Husserlian ideology, Stein can grasp only half of transpecific mitzvah, its status as sensation, but not its property of communion. And Shapiro, by continuing to phenomenologize in terms of empathy, risks obscuring at least the temporal aspect of existential priority vis-a-vis -vis human animal hermeneutics. Empathy is a force that builds bridges of identification across separation, whereas synthesis is a state or condition of merging through commonality, shy of total fusion. Empathy establishes atomic or molecular connections as external relations, but internally relational synthesis has no atoms to begin with. I depart from existentialist ideology at this point, there are those who believe that the personal center of consciousness is the radical reality. Ultimately, however, that being remains rooted in the co-basic reality of pedagogic circumstance, the ground of childhood, the soil of earthy nature and of mixed society into which we are born and through which we must develop. Isolation is always impure. Hermits and solipsists are refugees from the inescapable. Accordingly, we have to overcome the entire tradition of thought, from Fichte through Husserl and Sartre, that grants ontic primacy to ego or ontologic primacy to ideology. The whole modern discourse of eyes, capital I here, their first person faces wearing soulful eyes of empathy, is to be superseded somatologically as a truly transhuman ethos emerges. Let's consider, for example, a parkland scenario. Perhaps the quintessential inhabitants therein are the squirrels, to whom I trust most park visitors are accustomed. What kinds of bodily encounters are possible with these rodents? None the stay at home or pet keeping skeptic might retort. Certainly, we do not ordinarily cuddle or tussle with them, like we do, for example, with the typical household companion animal. Against such an objection, I hold that at least some of us sometimes have literal contact with squirrels. There are occasions, however infrequent, on which the rodents nibble foodstuffs from human hands. Moreover, tactile intimacy is not necessary to establish this invisible unity, I believe undergirds moral intuitions regarding the welfare of animals such as squirrels. Symphosis is sufficiently manifested in the somesthetic conviviality conducted through the medium of world flesh. Instances of intersomaticity that partially constitute this conviviality include that I note the passage of seasons in the bushiness of squirrels' tails, affecting a common climaticity, orally attend to their clucking barks as they play or mate, shaping the shared auditory life world, watch them forage for food as I also gather edibles, a scene sometimes eventuating simultaneous eating, and so on. 
How would such experiences lead to an appreciation of squirreldom? Much would depend on the tropological filters that are used. If I live to our rodents in general as deviant similars, then they will not be for me truly fellow mammals, but rather perverse pests. However, if I live toward them as related others, then I come to positively value aspects of their being. For example, taking up the associated aesthetic of marble, I become appreciative of tail bear. I admire the myriad observable operations of tail in squirrel style. Screening against wind, shading against sun, balancing on branches, cushioning for falls, guarding offspring, fun waving, sex splashing, and so on. Finally, alongside or through such appreciation, I'm inclined to feel, in a stewardly manner, obliged to protect squirrels. Positively, I experience a moral demand to look after their welfare. Negatively, I find it fitting that they go unharmed, subject to the ecosystemic dynamics of the park as buying. This is a concrete species expanded object lesson of bodily ethical argument recently put forth by Edith Fischerbrun in somewhat more abstract and decidedly more anthropocentric terms, to the effect that, quote, pain and death break into the descriptive and constitutive character of the body as text to introduce proscriptive and prescriptive meaning, end quote. Vulnerability, she observes, constitutes a proscriptive corporeal plea against violence, as if the other's body were saying, do not injure me. Likewise, according to Vishugrad, it is capable of engendering a prescriptive impetus toward ameliorative action, which may even result with repetition in a pattern of radically generous altruism. What are the pragmatic effects of this sensorial type of ethical experience? The obligation existentially developed already would tend, for example, toward disapproval of wanton tail chopping and pesticide or poison laying. The imaginative model of empathic identity deals with ethically troubling scenarios such as these by first assuming an experiential access of subject-object bifurcation and then allowing a psychic bridge to be built by the subject's cogitative transference of the object's imagined distress. In practice, this would typically mean mentally visualizing self as other, say a squirrel, then pretending to know the other's su suffering, for example, tail wounds pain, whereupon, by explicit or implicit appeal to moral sentiment, there arises the demand to alleviate present displeasure as well as an obligation to prevent identical or similar stress in the future. The identification model just furnished is off the mark, firstly, because it falsifies the phenomenological experience at hand. When I wince at a squirrel with tail freshly cut and bleeding, I do not imaginatively identify with the animal by a series of mental machinations. What Lawrence Hattab has said about interpersonal empathy applies also here, mutatis mutandis. Quote, empathic concern shows moments when we are directly and spontaneously, affectively there with the person, without a sense of conjuring up feelings or beliefs inside and then transferring them to the other person, or processing perceptual data as misfortune and then triggering an affect and then casting it out to the other. All of this is an inferential, all of this in an inferential procedure of external reception, internal processing, and projective transmission. No, the shared affect simply happens, end quote. Beyond such testimony of phenomenological fact, I suspect that the very notion of psychic identification being questioned is muddled. If I were that or a squirrel, what can a condition of this sort mean? Consider, if I were really a squirrel, then I would not be the human ego I know as me. I would no longer be my true self. And so it seems that real identity cannot be putatively transferred. A defender of such transference may wish to object that the process does not cancel, but rather sublimates anthropic <coughs> subjectivity into the zoomorphic persona. But then what imagination yields is either a humanoid squirrel or a squirrelly human, in any case not a squirrel simpliciter.
Though conceptually anthropocentric, my position is not ideologically anthropocentric. Quite generally, I hold that whereas we can and do intelligibly try to understand other circumstances from their points of view, we should give up the pretense that we are capable, under ordinary conditions, of colonizing anyone else's consciousness. Another reason why the empathic identification model goes awry is because it enforces a misplaced theoretical construct, the subject-object economy, upon the scenario in order to deliver the standard ethical paradigm of moral agent, say human observer, and moral patient, squirrel victim, for example. However, lived morality is not always, and seldom exactly, patterned in accord with this paradigm. In the examples under consideration, for instance, my ethical experience is that the synthetical life world shared with squirrels is so aesthetically lacerated when a tail belonging to one of them is cut by gratuitous violence. Likewise, the part life spell between, through, and around us has its existential fabric ripped when a normally nimble squirrel twitchingly tailspins into toxic seizure on account of poison. In such experiences, there emerges at once a moral awareness of ecosystemic fragility, beside an ethical sensitivity to organismic vulnerability. These sensibilities have deontic import. They motivate protectionist action, actions being taken and principles being formed on behalf, micrologically, of members of other species, such as individual squirrels, and macrologically, on behalf of eco forms, such as a park or woodland. Cultivating a body ethos of interanimality is not, finally, a matter of mentally working one's way into other selves or worlds by quasi-telepathic imagination, but it's rather about becoming sensitive to an already constituted interzone of somesthetic conviviality. I could go into other descriptions, other examples of different sorts of togetherness, such as partnership and neighborhood, but in the interest of time and preserving time for questions, I'll skip over that. Let me bring this in for a landing by asking, how does my account sit with other related accounts? Elisa Altola provides a useful typology of empathy, cognitive, mind reading, affective, emotional resonation, projective, virtual transference of position, and embodied intercorporeality of carnality. Following Hume and Adam Smith and viewing closely to etymology, I call resonation of sentiment sympathy, and do not use this latter term synonymously with pity, which has overtones of hierarchy or condescension. Like Altola, I believe sentimental resonation is a proto-ethical state of consciousness, especially important for interspecies morality. I depart from Altola in emphasizing shared somatic awareness as a conduit for resonation, where she seems to stress projective empathy as a route to resonation. I realize now that I may have misread her texts since her presentation today gives room to believe that she concentrates on both the embodied as well as the affective forms of empathy. I think that the latter is more relevant to mind reading and bridge building between developed differentiated selves, and that the former constitutes a kind of or experience of corporal compassion felt in parallel with merging relations or relatives. Of course, it is possible, and in some circumstances perhaps desirable, to combine these approaches. Lori Gruen appears to be doing something of the sort recently under the banner of what she calls entangled empathy. She's got an article and uh, a book, both, uh, with that title. It may even be that we need to gain facility in alternating between sympathy and empathy. And in this regard, we could take inspiration from Cynthia Willett's wave and particle model of ethics itself theorized under the influence of Karen Barad's quantum-inflected epistemology. Quote, while social phenomena on occasion take the shape of bounded, discrete moral subjects, particles, we particles also can function as ecstatic nodes within clouds of collective affect, 
waves. And through their zigzag action, will it pass it? These waves expand the self from an inner psyche to relational webs with and within other organisms that hover together in affect clouds, end quote. Interestingly, somatic attunement on this model can carry axiological import. Quote, animals synchronize affects through multiple sensory modalities to forge fields of value, end quote. Here, finally, we have fertile space for moral relationships and thus for ethical reflection. And I'll end there.